Good evening. I'm Dick Clay. I'm the president and the CEO of the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad that you've joined us for tonight's presentation. Simon Gurdy, Frontier Bad Man. It's presented by Richard Taylor. Richard Taylor grew up in Louisville, and he is the author of a dozen or so books, including poetry, two novels, and several books relating to Kentucky history, including Elkhorn, Evolution of a Kentucky Landmark. A former Kentucky poet laureate, he is the Keenan Visiting Writer at Transylvania University, where he teaches English and creative writing. He holds a PhD from the University of Kentucky and a law degree from the University of Louisville making his home on a small farm near Frankfurt, where he is the co-owner of one of my favorite bookstores of all time, Poor Richard's Books. He is currently working on a book about his family's role in the American Revolution. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits, but please join me now in welcoming Richard Taylor, the great, great, great to have you with us. Thank you, Dick, for that, for that generous introduction. Uh, let me begin with a change of titles. Uh, I've been working on this project for a long time and up until the last day or two. The new title is Fake News in the 18th Century notes toward the resurrection of Simon Gurdy's reputation. Fake news is not a recent phenomenon. It has a long, if undistinguished, history. One of the best examples I've encountered is in the person of Simon Gurdy and how distortion of fact has denigrated his character to an extreme mainly through a series of incidents that enabled one or two individuals to alter facts in order to push an agenda, hatred of native peoples and a misguided promotion of patriotism toward the end of the American Revolution. What I propose to do here is move a step closer to setting the historical record straight on his life. He lived from 1741 until 1818. The so-called white savage, often presented as a betrayer of his race. Much of what I say stems from a study of Gertie done years ago and published in my historical novel, Gertie, first published in California in 1977. Though it focuses on the life of Simon Gertie, my book is not the subject of this talk. Who was Simon Gertie and why write about him? The short answer is that he was probably the most hated man in America between Benedict Arnold and John Wilkes Booth. The longer is that he sided with the British and Native Americans during the American Revolution and fought against settlement of the Ohio River Valley in Old Northwest Territory until his death in 1818. Gertie is an important and often misrepresented figure who is often buried in the dark underside of American history. He has become a fixture of folk legend, often used several generations ago as synonymous with a boogeyman. I first learned about him in my fifth grade class at Emmett Field Elementary School, an experience that fueled my interest in frontier history. No Daniel Boone, not a positive American icon, he is a Kentucky bad boy, the dark side of the American mythos, a kind of inverted hero. My thesis is that Gertie is also a victim of the racism and stereotyping of Native Americans that has informed American experience 
from Jamestown until the present. Racism? Here is the 1897 assessment of Ed Porter Thompson in his Young People's History of Kentucky, 1897, used in Kentucky's public schools. It would be well if the name of this monster could be erased from the annals of Kentucky, unless it may be assumed that some good can accrue to the young from a knowledge of how fiendish even a white man may become where he puts himself outside of the pale of Christian civilization. His life presents nothing to be imitated, and it can hardly be said that a picture so demoniac is necessary in this enlightened age to awaken those feelings of strong reprobation which incline the inexperienced to shun the paths that lead to cruelty and crime. The young reader who prosecutes the study of the history of Kentucky will find that his associates from boyhood were brutal savages and that he was more brutal than they that his hatred of the pioneers was more satanic than that of the red men who believed that the white man was their natural enemy. It would be unprofitable to give the details of his murderous career. He died in Canada, opposite Detroit, in old age, poor, despised, and miserable, or as others assert, in the Battle of the Thames. I won't spend time going over Thompson's biases, except to say that his judgment of Gertie is highly colored and subject in a subjective appraisal of Simon Gertie, long on condemnation, short on sustainable fact. It is my belief that much of Thompson's condemnation is based on Gertie's alleged betrayal of his race in siding with Native Americans who resisted the appropriation of the Ohio River Valley in Northwest Territory by the settlement of our ancestors. Who was Simon Gertie? He was born near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1741, the son of Simon Gertie, an Irish immigrant, and Mary Newton, an Englishwoman. He was 10 when his father was killed by an Indian in a brawl. With two of the, his three brothers, Simon was captured by Indians in 1756 and lived among the Senecas for three years, learning their language and picking up two or three other uh, Native American languages as well. After his release, he was employed as a, an interpreter at Fort Pitt, what we know now as Pittsburgh until 1774. Though illiterate, he was commissioned a lieutenant in the Virginia militia at the outbreak of Lord Dunmore's war on the eve of the revolution. As a scout, he served with Simon Kenton and the two became blood brothers. He was also hired by the Continental Congress as an interpreter, but later discharged for unspecified ill behavior. In 1778, Gertie deserted the American cause with two other loyalists and was employed by Governor, British Governor, Sir Henry Hamilton, the so-called hair buyer, he, as an interpreter and as a scout, a post he held into a, until a few weeks before his death. Gertie was active in arousing the several tribes against white settlers and took part in numerous raids by British and Indians in the Ohio River Valley, including reportedly in 1792, one a mile or two from where I live near Elkhorn Creek. He participated in the siege of Bryan Station outside Lexington and the disastrous defeat of Kentuckians at the Battle of Blue Licks in 1782, the last great Indian battle in Kentucky and often described as the last battle of the revolution since it followed Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown in 1781. That same year, he was reported by Dr. John Knight to have been a name we'll come back to 
to have been a delighted spectator at the burning of the stake of Colonel William Crawford at Sandusky in Ohio. Less noted are the instances when he saved, was instrumental in saving other cap captives, including his lifelong friend, Simon Kenton. At the end of the war, Gertie was granted a British pension and in 1784 married Catherine Mallott, another captive, establishing his home in Canada and starting a family near Amherstburg, Ontario. In the Indian Wars that continued after the revolution, he scouted an occupation that kept him almost constantly among the tribes of the Ohio country where he opposed all efforts to make peace with the Americans and took an active part in many battles, including St. Clair's defeat, 1791, and Fallen Timbers, 1794, the last major battle involving Native Americans in the 18th century. When the British surrendered Detroit in 1796, Gertie returned to his home where he spent his later years. He was a less than perfect husband. His wife left him for a time because of his brutal behavior when drinking. Crippled by a fall from his horse that broke his ankle and at the same time slowly going blind, he died February 18, 1818 and was given a military funeral by the British. What are the reasons for the hostile feelings toward Gertie? One is simple racism, something apparently that Ed Porter Thompson, sharing the attitudes of his time, is not sensitive to. The supposition that white men are superior to Native Americans and that Christianity is the supreme value of civilization permeates his indictment of Gertie. That view has altered as Native Americans are regarded today, not as inferiors, but as representatives of cultures few whites of the era had any real knowledge of. This is also, I should mention, a period of, among Native Americans of transitioning from hunting, hunting and gathering into agriculture and confronting a industrialized uh, way of life in, in white America. Gertie seems to be someone who is regarded as rejecting the values of civilization in favor of a barbaric lifestyle. This is a view growing out of ignorance rather than insight. In retrospect, most of us acknowledge the attitudes of Native Americans who wished to preserve their lives and culture against the encroachments of Euro-Americans who slaughtered their families, cleared the wilderness to make way for settlement and brought smallpox for which Native Americans had no natural resistance. From the perspective of Native Americans, their way of life was threatened by aliens whose way of life was alien to their own. A more specific thesis I want to adopt here is that much of the hatred visited on Gertie was intensified by the capture and torturing of Colonel William Crawford in the aftermath of the Battle of Sandusky Plains, especially the highly inflammatory and doctored testimony of Dr. John Knight, no pun intended, who witnessed the torture and burning at the stake of Colonel Crawford. Who was Colonel William Crawford? 1722-1782. Crawford was a Virginian, a surveyor and soldier who served as a Western land agent for George Washington, with whom he made several surveying trips. Like Washington, Crawford served in the French and Indian War. He was a member of Washington's regiment. In 1770, he and Washington traveled down the Ohio to choose the land to be given to the regiment's veterans. 
Crawford had been active in the years preceding the revolution, receiving a major's commission in Lord Dunmore's war in 1774. He oversaw the building of Fort Fincastle at present day West Wheeling, West Virginia, and led an expedition that destroyed two Mingo villages near what is now Steubenville, Ohio. When the revolution came, Crawford recruited a regiment for the Virginia line and was promoted to Colonel. Crossing the Delaware with Washington and fighting in the East at the battles of Trenton, Princeton, and Long Island. Retiring from the army in 1781, he was persuaded by his neighbors to lead an expedition against the Indian villages along the Sandusky River. Soon learning of the expedition, a force of British and Native Americans eventually surrounded Crawford's men and captured him as well as his nephew and son-in-law, son both of whom were later executed. Taken to a village called Pipestown, Crawford himself was tortured for at least two hours and burned at the stake. The details of his death are too painful to relate. Why was his death so cruel? The simple answer is revenge. He was executed for the murders a few months earlier of 96 peaceful Delaware Indians at a Moravian settlement called Nodenhutten. Pardon my German pronunciation. The man who led the Pennsylvania militia that performed the murders was David Williamson, Crawford's second in command at Sandusky, an Indian hater who was lucky to escape being captured. It was his life that the Delawares most wanted in reprisal. What happened at Nodden Hutton? Nodden Hutton was a Moravian community of Delaware Indians who lived in the eastern part of what became Ohio. They had chosen neutrality during the American Revolution, not taking either side. Moravian evangelists had Christianized a number of Delawares and established several religious communities in Pennsylvania and Ohio. A community of these native peoples committed to Christian pacifism had established an agrarian village. Uh, Nodenhutten incidentally is German for cabins of grace. They became victims arguably of one of the most underreported and horrendous crimes against humanity in American history. I realize that statement may seem a little exaggerated. The shrine erected in commemoration of the Moravian Christian Indian martyrs includes a monument erected 90 years after the massacre. What were the circumstances of what today would be regarded as war crimes? On March 8, 1782, US militiamen from Pennsylvania under the command of Lieutenant Colonel David Williamson captured the village without any resistance telling its inhabitants that they would, quote, be relocated away from the warring parties, unquote. Once these peaceful Christians were rounded up, it was decided to execute them as spies. The great majority of the militia, numbering 160 men, went along with this decision, only 18 protesting and not participating. The night before their execution, the condemned spent their last hours praying and singing hymns, not, not one resisting since one of the core beliefs was non-resistance. Women and girls were systematically raped. Among those murdered were 28 men, 29 women, and 39 children. Two boys survived to tell of the massacre one of them having been scalped alive. Theodore Roosevelt in his ironically titled Winning of the West called the massacre, quote, a stain on frontier character that the lapse of time cannot wash away, unquote. 
The murders incensed the Delaware nation and created an appetite for revenge that William Crawford eventually paid for with his life. Western militiamen who had suffered from raids along the border blamed all indigenous people for the violence of some and did not distinguish between friendly and hostile tribes or bands. As we know, the war in the East ended with the defeat of General Cornwallis at Yorktown, 1781. But the war continued in the West. Much of the trouble emanated from the British stronghold at Detroit. Congress was bankrupt and unable to finance an expedition against Detroit, but permission was given for volunteer militiamen, most from Pennsylvania, to make an expedition to the Indian towns along the Sandusky River. <coughs> Excuse me. An election was held for commander and William Crawford, a friend of Gertie's from pre-Revelation days, won by only a few votes. His rival was David Williamson, a popular militia leader known for his hatred of North Americans. Thanks to reports of Simon Gertie and other scouts, <clears throat> the British and their Native American allies knew of the expedition and prepared for it. After the parties clashed during the first day, the Americans retreated during the second day. During that retreat, Crawford and Dr. John Knight were captured in making their retreat when they encountered a party of Delawares. After the massacre at Naden Hutton, the Indians resolved to kill all Americans that fell into their hands, rather than as the tradition was to hold them for ransom. Though the British had a policy of restraining torture of captives, after Naden Hutton, the Indians revived the practice of ritual torture to exact revenge for the slaughter at Naden Hutton. Enter Dr. John Knight, a little closer to home. Two and a half miles south of Shelbyville, on Kentucky 55 is an historical marker in commemoration of Dr. John Knight, 1748, 1838. According to the marker, he was a skilled surgeon and physician, the first to practice in Shelby County. He was born in Scotland and came to America in 1773 and served in the revolution under Colonel Crawford and was with him at the time he was captured in 1782. He witnessed the burning of Crawford and was intended himself to be burned at another village. He fortunately escaped his captor and was interviewed, an interview that produced a widely read account of Crawford's death. After his escape, he married Crawford's niece and settled in Shelby County in 1789 later serving honorably in the state legislature. Let's look more closely at Knight's background. He studied medicine at the University of Aberdeen before coming to America as a stowaway, tutoring Crawford's children at Crawford's farm in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, part of his indentured service. When the revolution began, Knight enlisted in the regiment commanded by Crawford and participated in the battles of Brandywine in Germantown. He was later appointed the regiment's paymaster, then surgeon's mate, and finally a surgeon. When the expedition to Sandusky was formed, Crawford requested him to come along. Knight was captured with Crawford, but managed to escape while being transferred to another Indian town to be executed. When he returned after three weeks, nearly starved and suffering from the terror he witnessed and experienced, he met a young writer and journalist named Hugh Brackenridge, who interviewed him and edited the doctor's account of Crawford's death. Prior to editing the account, Brackenridge had written theatrical tragedies about military heroes who died in battle. He had delivered a patriotic eulogy for American patriots 
who died in the revolution. He was also known as an ardent patriot who delivered passionate sermons to the troops, facts that partially explain his character and his passion for the American cause. Hugh Henry Brackenridge, 1748-1816, was a minor but important American writer. I can remember reading about him in graduate school, mostly associated with Pittsburgh, where he helped found what was to become the University of Pittsburgh. Like Crawford, he was born in Scotland and immigrated to this country in 1753. He was educated at what became Princeton. He served initially as one of Washington's chaplains and then became a schoolmaster in Maryland, a poet later and a satirist, and finally a publisher of a political magazine. He read law at Annapolis, Maryland and set out for the Western frontier in 1781, where he played an important role in interviewing Dr. Knight when he escaped captivity. No less a painter than Gilbert Stuart, as you can see, painted his portrait. In 1815, the year before his death, Brackenridge published a rambling novel, Modern Chivalry, considered the first important fictional work about the frontier. Knight in Brackenridge's account was printed in the Freeman's Journal in Philadelphia in 1783, and later through repeated editions in Brackenridge's Indian Atrocities, Cincinnati, 1867, and reprinted many times elsewhere. Here's where fake news comes in. Brackenridge edit the, edited the account of the ordeal of Dr. Knight and transformed his recollections into what has been described by historian Parker Brown as a piece of, quote, virulent anti-Indian, anti-British propaganda calculated to arouse public attention and patriotism, unquote. <clears throat> the problem is that no one for the next two centuries questioned the accuracy of Brackenridge's edited account. Until 1987, when Parker Brown published an article questioning the historical accuracy of the captivity narrative of Dr. John Knight. This was published in the Western Pennsylvania Historical Magazine. Brown's analysis of Knight's published account <clears throat> raises two questions. How much of Knight's narrative was deleted? How much added? The primary motivation of Brackenridge was to produce a popular sellable, sellable history, and in this he succeeded. He also wanted to stir up the populace of the West to turn back marauding war parties, as well as to avenge the death of Crawford, his friend. He also wanted to push government to send more troops to protect the West. His efforts had two consequences. To vilify Gertie even more than he had been vilified previously and to assassinate the truth. How? First, he ignored important Indian motivations as for example, Nadenhutten, as well as important facts. The blame falls not on Knight who was regarded as a man of undoubted veracity the editing is where the damage was done. Did Brackenridge omit important facts? First, he stated that Knight was weakened and in shock for three weeks and characterized his Scottish brogue as unintelligible. He said that Knight wrote out his account for him. This is patently untrue. Tellingly, Brackenridge ignored Knight's statement that the torture of Crawford as revenge for the massacre of Indians at Nodden Hutton three, three months earlier. He, this was not mentioned at all in the account. He also altered the timeline of events to omit the long council or trial held the night before Crawford's death, essentially a court or tribunal to weigh Crawford's fate. 
readers were kept ignorant of this important fact. Most importantly, Brackenridge then rewrote history by misrepresenting the attitudes and actions of Simon Gertie. For example, Gertie and Crawford were still friends at the time of Crawford's capture. Despite Gertie's desertion from the American cause four years before, they had been comrades during Lord Dunmore's war. It is not unreasonable that Crawford asked to see Gertie or that Gertie would make an effort to save Crawford's life, as he had for Simon Kenton and many other white captives, succeeding in every reported case. Why should he intervene on Crawford's behalf? Well, Crawford had secured a promotion for Gertie and it helped Gertie be released from prison at Fort Pitt when he was falsely accused of treason. This is before his actual defection to the British. Gertie evidently also had a revulsion for the inhumanity of tor torture, having himself been taken into captivity as a teenager. He had empathy for the suffering of others. Other sources indicate that Gertie, in fact, tried to save Crawford's life to the point that he put his own life in jeopardy. Breckenridge had said that Gertie had mocked the suffering Crawford when Crawford begged him to shoot him. According to Brackenridge, Gertie reportedly uh, mockingly said that he had no gun. Knight's narrative, as edited by Brackenridge, as I said, was printed in 1783. It was an instant success, presenting an account of a brave officer's death at the hands of fiendish savages. The narrative was also embroidered with descriptive scenes of the Ohio landscape and waterways. The narrative force was heightened by presenting an ideal hero in the hands of a devil incarnate, Gertie. Through the decades, the account went through numerous reprintings in Lexington, Nashville, and Cincinnati. It became a, a classic of captivity literature and was often imitated. As was said, no one questioned its authenticity. Living in Canada and hated until his death in 1818, Gertie never read it unless someone read it to him. He was illiterate, remember. Today, he would have a good case for libel and punitive damages. He was a victim of racial bias and misdirected patriotic zeal a victim of fake news. Ironically, in this light, he appears almost as much a victim as Crawford himself, feeding the narrative of racial hatred that persists, unfortunately, today. Now, Gertie is often regarded by thoughtful historians as someone who stood up for the rights of Native Americans, someone who had elect, elected to represent their interests. In Canada, he was, he was honored for his service and given land and a pension when he retired. Though there are still some clouds over his reputation, we might regard him as a flawed character, a person whose allegiance to the British and Native American side of the war is understandable, if not praiseworthy. Uh, I wanna mention, uh, that first image we saw of Gertie. Uh, years ago, I saw a book about Canadian uh, bad boys and uh, heroes. And in it, this image appeared. So I wrote the publisher and months went by. Finally, a letter came from Canada with the with a photograph of this image and the person who sent it to me was a descendant of Simon Gertie himself with the name interestingly Dwight Gertie and thanks to Dwight Gertie uh, I was invited to a commemoration of Gertie's event and I still regret 
that I did not attend that ceremony. And there was another one in Pittsburgh, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, I missed that one too. The lesson from this little talk is that history is that history sometimes needs to wash its linen. And that's what I've tried to do tonight. Thank you very much for listening. Richard, that was absolutely outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. A few questions have arisen and I'll start with one that's not in the chat room, but something that I've always heard about Simon Gurdy and you mentioned it, I think, briefly at the very beginning, and that was the battle at Bryan Station and the remarkable story, be it true or apocryphal, of Jemima Johnson and the Johnson family. Could you talk to us about that and just cover it? And, be, and was indeed Gertie there? Gertie, Gertie, from all accounts, was there, and he became a kind of spokesman. And apparently outside of Ryan Station was a corn patch in which he stood and summoned the fort, uh, saying that uh, the terms would be generous if people inside the fort uh, conceded or gave up, capitulated. And someone inside the fort, I think his name was, was Reynolds, hurled an insult at Gertie saying, I have an old cur dog and I call him Gertie. There's uh, a dog in the background as you're speaking right now. <laughs> Is she perking up? They're perking up. <laughs> they are my witnesses. And there are two in here with me, but you can't see them. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, but uh, the, the real question in my mind is to what degree Gertie or the British or Indian leaders masterminded the defeat at, uh, at Blue Licks. They managed to draw the militia from the three counties of Kentucky including the cream of uh, Lexington leadership, including I think its founder. And there was a party of 180 militia who converged, followed the Indians to Blue Lick and were sucked into an ambush so that of the 180, I think 70 were killed, uh, several of whom have counties in Kentucky named for them, Trigg and I think Simpson are two of them. Daniel Boone was there and cautioned uh, the party not to cross the Licking River, but to send out scouts. And uh, there's a story that he was disregarded and someone spoke some brave words and these Kentuckians crossed the river and rode or walked right into that ambush. As a consequence, though Boone escaped, his son Israel, uh, the second son he had lost in Kentucky, was, was killed there. Wow, thank you. Um, let's see here, we've got some excellent questions. How strong was the Tory presence on the Kentucky frontier? That's a good question. Uh, Gertie had a couple of, uh, we, we know that there was an expedition, I think by Captain Henry Byrd, I think that was his name, who brought artillery into Kentucky and uh, managed to capture Ruddle Station. And uh, there was a lot of Tory sentiment in Kentucky, some of it at Boonesboro and the Callaways. Uh, Richard, I think it was Richard Callaway, who's often been identified as really a Tory in sentiment. I think there was more Toryism uh, in the East, especially I think in North Carolina. And, uh, but, but if people had Tory sentiments in Kentucky, uh, most people, they were, they were pretty wise to keep quiet about it. 
and uh, there wasn't really an active military presence of settlers in Kentucky who were Tory in their, their allegiance. Uh, was Gertie a Tory? And, and if so, what, what drove Gertie into British arms? Well, there were several incidents in which he felt he had been mistreated. He had been promised uh, a promotion, which he did not receive. He had been promised an increase in pay, which he did not receive. He was sometimes taunted as, I suppose, uh, an Indian lover. And uh, finally, I think he had had enough of it. And he was persuaded by a couple of other loyalists, uh, one of whose name, was, let's see, Alexander McKee and Matthew Elliott. And the three of them left uh, Fort Pitt together. And I think that Gertie probably felt, one, some kinship with the native peoples with whom he had lived during his formative years, as well as the British who seemed truly to value his services as an interpreter, and a scout. But what his politics are, you know, he left no records, of course, and uh, we can only surmise uh, what his real allegiance was. Was it, was it primarily toward the British in America, or was it because the British supported Native peoples? And I think more likely it was the Native people. And I, I think earlier you said that uh, he, he wasn't perfect. So, you know, he, he did receive a pension at the end from the British. And uh, in, in some ways, I guess you could say that he was a paid spy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Um, going to another question. Um, uh, and this is more of a statement, but you may be able to give JT Miller some advice. Uh, he says, old genealogical work in my family says, I'm a descendant of Crawford. I have a William Crawford uh, great, great, great grandfather, but I do not have proof it was the colonel. Simpson died at Fallen Timbers, he says as well. Is there any advice you could give him on tracking? Gosh, uh, you know, Crawford's life ought to be pretty fully delineated, and though it's not fashionable in academic circles to say this, I would start first at Wikipedia and look at the sources on Crawford that are cited there. I suspect there are books in your library at the Filson which uh, have accounts of, of Crawford and his genealogy. Uh, the family was prominent. He was closely associated with Washington. Washington regarded him as a friend. Uh, he might also check, if, he, if he's in Louisville, in addition to Filson, I would check the, with the uh, Sons of the American Revolution, as well as perhaps online, <laughs> the uh, Society of the Cincinnati in Washington. And uh, Mr. Miller, for uh, the Filson, I think the person I would reach out to initially would be Jenny Cole, um, who is our research line, uh, uh, curator, or I'd reach out to Cassie Bratcher, who is our uh, librarian. Now, also, here's another question. In your book, you present Gertie's thoughts as poetry. Mm -hmm. How and why did you decide to balance Gertie's infamous actions with an inner Gertie represented through poetry? Okay, okay. Uh, through poetry as well as sort of, uh, I would call it stream of consciousness. Um, history deals with big people and big events. Our lives are a series of heartbeats and much of our lives goes on between the heartbeats. We know a lot, or a fair amount, about Gertie's external circumstances. I wanted to present a human Gertie, uh, not to laud him. Gertie was a flawed individual, as I said earlier. 
uh, no better or no worse than many of us. To some degree, he was caught up in circumstance. And I felt that creating uh, the world or recreating the world of the frontier as Gertie saw it and experienced made it not in key moments, but in, in, in sort of everyday instances, shooting a deer, for example, and he must have done that many times, uh, would, would give him a kind of grounding away from this idea of an inhuman beast. Did Gertie play an active role in the War of 1812? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's a very good question. By that time, he was, uh, let's see, 40, he, he, was, he, was, he was getting up in years. And as I mentioned, he, was, he had had a fall. He, he, he had a drinking problem. Uh, and he had a fall from his horse. But, you know, I can't answer that question directly. I'm not sure that he was... Uh, whether he was at the Battle of the Thames, as Ed Porter Thompson said uh, or suggested, I don't actually know. If he was, he played a, uh, an inconspicuous role. What intrigued you about Gertie and what, what um, oh gosh, what I'm Gertie, interested in yeah. Gertie um, scholarship? Okay, well, People have written, I've tried to, I'm interested in what you might call Kentucky bad boys. I wrote a book about Simon, about, pardon me, about Marcellus Jerome Clark, uh, otherwise known as Sue Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I ran out of villains, including the Hart brothers, the Hart brothers were just too inhuman to consider or to try to put in a human light. Uh, when I ran out of them, I moved on to Audubon, and uh, whose fascinating life and with many Kentucky connections. He lived here maybe nine years or so total. Uh, and then Lincoln. Uh, and, and that was sort of a daunting subject because Lincoln, of course, has been written about more than any single individual other than Jesus Christ. So uh, I like looking at, there's an appeal to this kind of darker side of things. And, and I'm not by nature uh, representing that, but, but it's very curious to me about the nature of evil and uh, why it, why it uh, seems to have a hold on so many individuals. Not that it did Gertie. I'm trying to resurrect Gertie here. Here's one. Um, Simon Gertie wasn't the only white settler to align with the natives. And they cite a uh, blue jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that their motivation was sympathy um, of the natural lifestyle of the Native Americans or, or just? Yeah. I think that's a good part of it. Interestingly, uh, Blue Jacket, if I remember, was uh, his last name was Von Swearingen, I think. And he was uh, captured, just as Gertie was, as a young man and adopted by the Shawnees, I believe, and became one of their principal leaders. If any of your listeners are interested in reading about him, uh, he's, I think, treated fairly fully in the fictional history or history written as fiction uh, done by Alan Eckert and probably in The Frontiersman, but maybe in one of the later books as well. One last question, and it's a big one. What do you think should be Simon Gertie's place in American history? What, what should it be? Well, like Benedict Arnold, I think he can be regarded as a person who betrayed his country, though not to the degree that, that or with the definitiveness 
that that Arnold did. Arnold had his his reasons, not very laudable reasons. I think Gertie had a genuine sympathy for native peoples. He lived among them. Uh, he he knew the language. He knew the culture, and it probably suited his lifestyle. Remember, he was sort of a son of the frontier and a person who had not had the advantages of an education that would have given him a suitable place in, in white society. So this place in history, uh, I think he is an important minor figure of the Revolutionary War as it played out in the West. Not as important as George Rogers Clark, certainly, yeah. but, but a figure to be reckoned with. And he's so interesting because he sort of bridges or spans two different cultures. And I think that's, uh, that's a matter of, of some interest, I think, to, to many historians as well as those of us who love history. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Dr. Richard Taylor, uh, author, poet, historian, English professor, um, owner of an important bookstore, restorer of a house, um, poet laureate of Kentucky, um, a major figure in his own right in Kentucky history. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dick. It's been a pleasure. Same here. Bye, everybody. Have a good evening. <laughs>